and a very warm welcome to this month's Master Investor Monthly Mashup with myself, Sarah Lother, and Jonathan Davis, author, investor, podcaster, editor of the Investment Trust's Handbook. So, Jonathan, it's AGM season, and this is the time of year when investors can have their say, you know, vent their frustration, adult to adult, shareholder to shareholder. You know, some companies know what to expect, and then sometimes you don't know whether you need to take preemptive measures because you're not quite sure what's going to come through that door because of course a lot of um, AGMs are no longer virtual they're um they're, they're happening in person in the city uh yes I think that's true uh unfortunately I have to confess I haven't been to an AGM for about five years so I'm not <laughs> the best authority on the subject um I guess I'm quite lucky because I get the chance to speak to uh company uh, boards and managers and so on uh, quite a lot anyway out of the season so I don't bother with the AGMs um, but tell me what what goes on how uh, you know are they more lively than they used to be I mean when I was on the board of an investment trust uh, we used to get two people that are AGM and um, they often asked you know quite intelligent questions but um, that was it we didn't get more than that and uh, it was always over quite quickly but uh, uh, what are, what's it like? Are they, is, is there more action these days? So I'm waiting to hear the outcome of um, Land or Resources AGM. So the the founder and the chief executive, Bill Octogenarian, he um he was kind of gently pushed out, and there's a new chief executive coming in. This new is chief only, executive only eighty, and he was pushed out. Good God, that's shocking. <laughs> well, the thing was, um, within his career. He had, um, you know, a, a, he had a proven career in proving up resources and then selling assets on. And they've got this asset in Canada and, you know, five million ounces of gold had been mentioned um, and um, interested parties talking about buying the assets, not, not necessarily the, the company. And um, it seemed as though he was just keeping it close and uh, so there was you know, shareholder activism uh, leading up to the AGM so it'll be interesting to hear whether the uh, the announcement of the new chief executive this morning is going to appease or whether there's still going to be a rumble but I'm just thinking at the timing of the AGMs we've had a long six months I think a lot of people are fed up a market, junior market, still going down. Of course, the FTSE 100 acting in a con contrary motion, but I tend to deal mainly with the junior market companies. And I, I tend to find that the AGMs for the junior market companies, they tend to be quite vocal. And then both management and investors, they go down, they, they lie down in a darkened room and um, think cogitate over summer. And I am anticipating that we are going to have a quiet summer because it's been quite a, a frantic six months. It certainly has been for me in terms of my events and the conversations I've been having. I'm a bit out of puff myself. Right. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, I guess it's, you're, you're talking about a little bit about the sort of the mood, the public mood and your mood in particular, but the public mood, um, I guess the public mood is pretty, is pretty down at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of negative news in the headlines, not just in the markets, but more generally, there's a lot of you know bad news out there. Um, and we seem to hear a lot of it. Um, but the interesting thing is that if you look at the market indicators overall, you know, um, confidence is coming back. But nothing like a bit of a rally in the main market indices anyway. You know, if you look at the US market or or the UK has gone sideways, basically. But basically, confidence is going up in terms of investor confidence. Uh, having been very, very low, which is often a very good contrarian indicator, of course, that when people are really all gloomy, then um, it's often a good time to buy. So the question is, you know, the markets have rallied quite nicely a little bit, um, apart from the bond market, which is going downhill fast. Uh, so where are we? I don't know. I, I can't really read the public mood at the moment. I'm um, uh, Maybe you're right. People maybe feel they've just had a really tough three years, which indeed they have. Um so I don't know where that's going. I have to admit, I, I think it's rather kind of balanced at the moment between the, the gloomsters and the uh, and the eternal optimists. So last time we were talking, you were talking about the indebtedness of all the major governments. And we were looking to see what the debt situation in the United States was. 
whether the, uh, the 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 parties would come to an agreement in terms of whether they would they would um, allow more the country to become more indebted. So that seemed to have gone through. But of course, it's not just the US that's hugely indebted. Here we are in the the UK. We're very indebted, and Thames Water that's hugely indebted. Yes, well, there's two aspects of that. I mean, yes, the UK generally is the government is is, is in massively indebted and most indebted it's been for over 40 years um and of course doing that at a time of rising interest rates is not a good position to be in but the water one is interesting isn't it yes i mean we've talked about the fact that you know rising interest rates have have uh, negative implications for a lot of investments um but we don't you know and so we've seen little sort of patterns pockets of it if you like we saw it in the, with the little banking crisis and so on but uh, it's it's also showing up in other places, and one of the places it's showing up is in the in the water industry, which, as you know, was privatized. A lot of private equity ownership there, and guess what? They really loaded up with debt uh, because they got these nice secure cash flows. So they really loaded up with debt. But even these very smart professional investors, effectively being caught out because their debt costs are shooting up, uh, and they've already you know geared to the limit. So as a result, they're really struggling. And we've seen that with Thames Water. The CEO, as you say, has quit. Um, and they may have to be nationalized or at least temporarily rescued. Uh, and I'm afraid it's just a symptom of what happens when, you know, if you allow interest rates to go up very sharply uh, or allow inflation to get out of control, it takes time for all these negative effects to, to feed through. And we find out in uh, Warren Buffett's phrase, you know, who's who's been swimming naked when the tide goes up. And I'm afraid uh, it looks like the water companies are... Uh, uh, among those I must admit I am a wild swimmer and my uh, wetsuit has been hanging up for at least a year because I became very mindful of the fact that I was often swimming amongst um, human effluent which wasn't good and I, I remember thinking how's that got here but you just don't want to think about how it got there in the first place so then you start uh, swimming in quarries but that's kind of dangerous as well and the last time I went wild swimming in a, um, a away from any um, sort of water outlets I ended up getting covered in leeches and I was just thinking you know what this isn't fun anymore despite the fact that um, I wasn't naked and I was covered in a sort of neoprene suit so a lot of people were saying oh she stepped down because um, the the wild swimmers have had their say but as you said I think there's there's more fundamental macroeconomic reasons for her departure. <laughs> well i think but also i mean the point is you're entitled to to you know to uh, to think that if you go uh, i mean admittedly perhaps uh, while swimming in in inland it might be difficult while swimming you know in the sea is different but uh you're, you're entitled to believe that your water will be reasonably clean i think that's perfectly reasonable but unfortunately of course the problem is that that does require massive investment um and we've had massive investment and uh, of course there'll now be a lot of talk about we must you know we must renationalize why do we ever let these things be privatized uh, which is you know a fair point the privatized companies have not done a good job but of course the problem is that we have been spared the need to uh, fund all that investment over the last uh, 30 years since these things are privatized and we just don't have the capacity to do everything that uh, you know we now need to do and that's the the danger when you over gear whether you're a government or a company or whatever you just run out of room and i think you know so knee-jerk reaction yes let's renationalize them but then how are we going to pay for all the investment we need? It's a, it's a dilemma, and every country tries to deal with it in a different way. Um, but we're one of the few. I mean, I think it's fair to say there was a really thundering uh, editorial in the Times this morning. You know, the thunderer, as it used to be known, really kind of laying into uh, the water companies uh, and the and the investors that own them, which incidentally includes the uh, I, I read this morning the university's superannuation scheme, the you know the uh, the pension scheme for all the university uh employees they're up to the necks in uh in uh in thames water in particular um so you know people make these mistakes all the time but the fundamental problem is you know how do we provide the basic core public services that people want whether that's water or whether that's uh, the health service or whatever it might be we just haven't found a way to do that in this country effectively we just can't get the balance right and the and the more we slip into debt the less you know the harder it's going to become so i'm afraid it's not a very good uh I'm now depressing myself now but talking about this is not a very good it's not a very good uh, uh model shall we say for future generations to ponder so the analysts at ubs they're 
pretty concerned about the indebtedness of BT as well, um, suggesting to BT that they should cut their dividend, that they should be mindful of their pension deficit. So that was uh, that was pretty gloomy for my parents who who love their divvy. But it seems as though the the bigger companies, I know the FTSE 100 is, is, is operating in a contrarian motion to the junior markets, but those with exposure to higher interest rates, higher interest rates are not necessarily a good thing, unless you've got your savings, of course. Yeah, but I think but I think the, so there's a question there about the level of interest rates and the uh, you know the speed at which they're increased, and uh, the level of interest rates. Okay, we're up to you know gilts are trading between four and five percent, something like that, which is pretty much the norm. You know, back in the day before the global financial crisis, it's not like this is some sort of terrible uh, you know kind of plague, biblical plague that's hit us, four percent or five percent in normal times. If we were able to keep our uh, you know somewhere close to our inflation target. Would be about right. You'd normally expect uh, them to be, uh, you know, somewhere around that level. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, what's happened since the global financial crisis, something which, you know, many of us have been warning about for a while, is that, you know, the combination of QE and and very very low interest rates has just created more debt. And you know, remember people said after the global financial crisis, you know, it's a bit strange. This how come is that the answer to, you know, a serious debt crisis is to have more debt? I mean, it doesn't make any sense really. So we've controlled the rate of interest and uh, a lot of lot of negative consequences coming from that. Um, but interest rates per se, you know, they're a symptom, really. And uh, I think four or five percent, I think it's going to be here for a while. Just thinking about the water companies, so a lot of the water companies have um, imposed hose pipe bans. We are coming into the six, seven, eight weeks of really high temperatures, which we should be prepared for so is there any correlation between the heat of the weather temperature wise and share price performance market performance what are you expecting do people become do their brains fry and we're not expecting to see much activity even though you say summer is the time to get your finances in order well, I don't know. I never actually looked at that. Now, maybe there is a correlation between <laughs> temperatures and the way that people behave. I don't know. I, I would guess there might be. Um, but I think in aggregate, probably not. I mean, I think that's just, a, uh, you know, one of those things how we feel. But why is the summer tend to be, a, you know, a weak period for markets? Tend to, not always. Uh, well, that's a good question. Maybe mainly because people go away. I think that's that's a bigger reason than uh, just what the temperature's like. Uh, people go away on holiday. Um, you know, professionals go away on holiday in August and so on and uh they tend to just sort of sit tight over that over that period but we also do get uh, we tend to get uh, you know international crises often blow up in august uh that's another thing that uh, one's observed over the years so um but normally it's a good time to be uh, you know when others are not doing much it's a good time for you to be doing something so um but this year has been rather un unusual because the markets have been you know rel relatively um if you look at the main main major indices They've been, uh, you know, some of them been doing quite well. Uh, it's only down in mid and small cap where uh, I know you spend a lot of your time that things have been pretty ropey uh, and getting are still getting bad, we're getting worse. I did a conversation this week with um, James Henderson, who's a fund manager at Henderson Investors, uh, has been doing it for 40 years. Um, and he was pointing out, which a lot of people pointed out, that in terms of the UK market, small cap in particular, you know, valuations are nearly back down to the worst they've ever been. So average sort of P around eight times, something like that, which compares to, um, you know, 6%, just over 6% after the global financial crisis and uh, around 8% during the, the pandemic sell-off. So things are about as, you know, cheap as they've ever been in the small cap sector. And he, you won't be surprised, yeah, he's quite bullish because he, <laughs> he thinks that it can't get much worse, even if we don't quite see what the catalyst is just yet. So this could be a very good time to be loading up on, uh, on mid and small cap shares. I'm not so sure about AIM, though. AIM seems to be having particular problems at the moment. And um, I don't know how quickly that's going to come back. That's just gone down, 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 down. Uh, and maybe that's partly because people think that there will be changes to the tax regime. There's a change of government. I don't know whether that's a factor or not. You know, all the, the business property relief, IHT kind of benefits, that seems to come right out. So the valuations of AIM companies are now, you know, on a par or worse than equivalent uh, companies in the uh, in the main market. So 
lots of things swirling around, but I think, you know, small, small cap and mid cap UK, unloved, nobody wants them. They could be due to a revival quite soon. And what international crises are you anticipating will happen in August? I'm not saying there will be one every year. There isn't one every year. Um, I don't know. It just so things happen, blow up. I mean, you remember the, in the 1990? Well, you probably don't remember because you're so young. But you know, in the 1990s, we had the Russian crisis. Uh, you know, a Russian crisis again. Uh, and then um, we often have issues. Um, uh, you remember um, long-term capital management that blew up. That uh, sort of bunch of clever clog academics who started a a hedge fund and thought they'd they'd sold everything they're kind of early pioneers of of uh, of ai if you like uh that didn't go so well that happened in august um i don't know there's just been a few things and um well who knows what's happening in russia you know that is a very interesting situation i suspect it will if you like kind of blow over in it as a as a sort of temporary blip what's been happening out there uh the, the mutiny and so on it's a very strange story um but, you know, we've got another winter coming up as well. So, you know, that's one of the things I think we should be slightly worried about. You know, with the, you know, the energy crisis, we solved it last year or we got through by taking on a lot more debt, among other things. But can we do that again if, if the war is still going at that point? I don't know. So I don't know what's going to happen in August, but, um, you know, it wouldn't be surprise me if something did. One of my events um, last week, there was a lady <clears throat> who's of Taiwanese origin and she's debating whether she goes back to Taiwan. She said, we will be invaded by China. She said, I, I'm just wondering whether I should get back there now before it's occupied and I'm unable to get back. So that could possibly be one thing that happens. But uh, my events have been pretty interesting recently. Um, last night, there was security engaged. I was um, sitting in the reception of a hotel waiting to apprehend a bad lad um, who had disrupted one of my events four years ago. And there was no way I was going to allow that to happen again. Had turned up with his mate, inebriated, menacing, um, yeah, disruptive. And I gave him short shrift, but unfortunately I'd, I'd given him a platform for his voice, which was pretty, was pretty unintelligent, but it was, it, yeah, it was unsettling. So, um, what people don't realize is when you've been doing events for 10, 11, 12 years, you recognize email addresses, you recognize um, times that registrations come in, if they come in late just before the event start, starts. There's all sorts of patterns and you can change your email address, but we'll still know that um, you're not the usual crowd. So we, you know, we are prepared to say we, there's events organizers, there is the hotel, et cetera. And uh, we were threatened with um, all sorts of things, with profanities as well. And I was just thinking, no, my my guests are coming to have a nice time. A lot of them have been to about four or five AGMs this week. I want them to come enjoy listening to three presenters and, uh, and have some fun. So in any case, um, I couldn't sit in the reception all night because I was hosting the event so I, I I left my sentry point three minutes before the event started, started the event, and then you could see a stooge coming in. You know the stooges. You know that um, the bad lads are actually cowards. They send their mates. And um, right at the end, um, the, uh, the stooge starts saying, can I ask a question? And I said, no, you were late. You haven't listened to the presentation. So no, that was it. And um, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a worrying story. I mean, who are these people, that, you know, for whose their life is so miserable that they have to go and cause trouble at, uh, you know, investor meetings? That's uh, extraordinary. Did he have some vengeance, you know, because he'd invested in this company and done very well or something? Was that was that a sort of background to it? That was the background. The background was um, it was uh, wasn't against me or the people hosting the event. It was um, he was he just harasses this one presenter, this one company. Apparently, he's lost a lot of money. He told us he's lost a million pounds, which is a hell of a lot of money, which would make him probably a TR1 investor. But the thing is, and if that's the case, then then that's awful. However, you have to know when to sell. And also the price of stocks and shares go up as well as down. And it's a fundamental lesson in 
really is. That's Particularly it. if you're in the resources business, which I think this company was, wasn't it? Uh, you know, exploration companies where it's all kind of hit and miss and things don't often work out the way that you hoped. Uh, they're very, very volatile. But I mean, what sort of idiot puts a million pounds into into a, a company like that unless they have, you know, 100 million? And, uh, you know, recalling the old adage about airline stocks, you know, what's the best way to become a millionaire is to start with a billion and invest in an airline stock. Uh, and you'll soon have, a, you'll be down to whatever it is. So, um, yeah, well, what an idiot. Unfortunately, well, I'm sorry for him, but what an idiot. And what, what good does uh, ranting and raving do? It doesn't really achieve very much, I'm afraid. No, it doesn't. There are plenty of platforms for debate, but um, I did actually go onto the bulletin boards and take him on um, just before the event, just to say, look, I remember you. I'm aware of you. And um, whether that was enough, you know, to keep him away. I don't know, but it's just boring. It's boring. It really is boring. However, it was a very, very good event. And um, yeah, I'm looking, and I think my next event probably August, September, but will I be lying down in a darkened room if my cat allows me to, Jonathan? I don't know what you're doing this summer. <laughs> uh <laughs> Well, I'm just doing what I do. Actually, to tell you what I am doing, I've just started the process of, uh, you know, uh, producing the Investment Trust Handbook for next year. I mean, it takes it's a it's a five month process. So I've just started that we've uh, started the process. I'm trying to think through and uh, uh, the, the great uh, knack of this is to try and work out what's going to be what the world's going to look like at the end of the year rather than how it looks like now. So you can't get you can't get too far ahead of yourself because things do change a lot. And typically they do change quite a lot in the autumn as well. So. You know, never mind August, there's quite a lot of ground to cover yet. So that's what I'm doing. I'm sitting here in the lovely sunshine where I am and um, just starting to think about that and talking to a few people about what we're going to put in the handbook and uh, uh, and how things may turn out. Um, needless to say, don't tell anybody, I don't actually know how things are going to turn out, but, you know, I've got a few hunches. And uh, <laughs> like everybody else, you just got to you know, ride it, ride with it, see where we go. But... Um, <laughs> Speaking about books, Jonathan, I've been sent this by Sam Volkering. Um, the, crypto, oh, yeah. the Crypto Handbook, The Ultimate Guide to Understanding and Investing in Digital Assets, Web3, The Metaverse, and more. I can honestly say that from the first chapter that I've read, I am no longer afraid of cryptos. It's a super, super book. It's leading me by the hand. Um, I think I understand it. I think I understand cryptos. Thank you, Sam. Well, next time we will have to let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know I recognise the the format of that book. It's a it's a Harriman House publication, like the Investor Trust Handbook, and um, uh, hopefully it's modelled on the Investor Trust Handbook. And if it's helping you, then I'm very encouraged by that. So let's talk about that next time. Yeah, let's let's get this crypto business finally sorted. Yes, me, you, and um, Sam virtually. So it says to Sarah, I hope you enjoy my book. And I look oh. forward to sharing the stage again with you at some point in the future. Kind regards, Sam. He was at the Master Investor Conference with me. And yeah, let's hope that it's a, it's a stage where there's, there's, there's no bad lads in the audience. But Jonathan, thank you very much for joining me. I'm not sure if we'll speak in July. Um, if we do, that's great. But if not, I'll see you after summer. Okay, well then, best wishes to your cows. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.